cool. It is Monday, January 8th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it's a very, very exciting get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Monday. Um, I've been feeling like I might be coming down with something like bronchial or something in my throat or something like that. I couldn't tell you. Anyway, um, I did make it into class today. I did a full Jiu Jitsu 1 class, although I did lag a little teeny tiny bit during the warm up. They, they were going a little bit too fast for me. For for my first class back for the week, it was just a little too fast. So anyway, um, <clears throat> today was kind of exciting because the instructor, one of the instructors that actually originated, like the, that opened the gym that I've been working out at, um, he finally managed to uh, make it back into uh, into instructing today. And it was it was very special to see him back on the mat, uh, spe- specifically because of the duration that he was away. Um, he's had a, a few personal things that, he, that uh, he's had to deal with, you know, that we all eventually do. But um, on top of that, you know, it was like injuries, car accidents, all kinds of impediments that probably would have forced a lot of us off the mat permanently. But no, not this guy. He's back at it. And hopefully, I will be seeing him again, because I, I feel like, well, I mean, you know, more often, um, just because I feel like his his style of instruction, I, I do like the uh, the instructors at my school very much, but I like his his style of instruction because he's very, ke- very, very keen to catch on every single thing and, like, kind of wh- whittle it down a little bit, you know, and give you a, uh, a digested synopsis on why you would do certain things and why you would not do other certain things you know it's i i have certain tendencies that i have to break myself of you know i i haven't gotten quite into my leg game yet so my my anti-leg game defense is kind of kind of not really there yet (laughs) i mean i have basic concepts of it but it's like if somebody were trying to work me into an ankle lock i'd probably feed him my leg be like here dude (laughs) <laughs> go ahead twist it <laughs> you know just inadvertently um but we did work some interesting stuff today we worked mostly the um the butterfly guard and honestly i i haven't worked the butterfly enough um i i think that if i were to master the butterfly guard that um that that could definitely be my go to cuz i was seeing a lot of potential in there for for things like guillotine chokes and and loop chokes and lapel chokes all this other stuff that i think i could get away with from the butterfly that i i'm not so certain that i would be able to do from like half guard or or whatever i don't know Uh, it's just it felt really really natural you know for the type of setups that i do and the type of game that i have um it just felt natural. It was just like, yeah, you know, if I could, if I could master that and keep somebody in my butterfly guard, I, I think I'd, I'd be giving people a lot of trouble. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. As far as table fair today, um, we have a few things. Um, I haven't, I haven't like ironed out any specific direction, but I, I have been reading up on cryptocurrencies as I do, and uh, some interesting stuff going on out there. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw it down. I have not picked a song yet, but it's got to be Anthrax because, you know, they're like first in line here. A little bit of time here on Coin Metal. And that was Prong with Looking for Them. And, you know, that one can, uh, that can be taken multiple ways here in uh, cryptocurrency land. And, uh, you know, it could be taken as far as, like, you know, the block reward, looking for them, you know. But I think more this year, and I've been I've been predicting this, and those of you who follow this show have heard me talk ad nauseum about how I believe we are on the verge of 
another mining boom or an, another boom in interest in mining by the average person. And I, I do believe that within the next year, possibly two, that video cards are actually going to be beating ASICs for efficiency. Now, that, that's just my opinion. But, you know, see, I, I happen to think that, like, NVIDIA, I, I think they're way bigger than Antminer. You know, I think that they've been doing what they've been doing a lot longer than Antminer has. And if they can look into the future just a teeny tiny bit and see that there's a great deal of potential for them to continue to dominate this space if only they make cheaper, faster, you know, more efficient cards and they, they could be blowing A6 out of the water. And I really think that that's a, that is going to be the next phase of the mining race that we see. You know, the, the, these people that whine about ASICs, <laughs> okay, they got a couple years out of it. That's really, but they're, that, they're about due to get eclipsed by an, a new iteration of miner that is either faster, more efficient, you know, ha, more, more hashing power for the electricity that you put into it, you know, smaller, cooler, uh, something to this effect and ASICs are going to lose their dominance because you know you'll be able to put these new cards in places that you can't necessarily mine with ASICs you know you could possibly afford to like mine in the desert because you don't have to spend as much on cooling or whatever point being that it will open up more surface for mining and that will mean that more of it is going to be done by us you know, average people and less by Jihan Wu. You know, I, I, I have to laugh at people that whine about Jihan. The man has a lot of miners. Good for him. He's got a lot of miners, not only in China, but elsewhere as well, including the United States. So now rather than whine about him, why aren't you trying to compete with him? And, and it doesn't even matter if you're able to beat him. You just got to compete with him. Because by competing with him, you make his position in the mining game that much less. You see what I'm saying? But, you know, it's like, I, I think that that's what disappointed me most about the UASF movement. Because the concentration was on miners. And basically, it was... Putting I, it, it wasn't on miners, it was on nodes. Sorry, the concentration was on just making these stupid ass nodes. Well, the, the reason being is that nodes are what propagate the transactions across the network, and so if they're only if, if the vast majority of them are only propagating SegWit transactions then SegWit transactions will be the dominant number, uh, dominant percentage of transactions that actually get into a block. And this is, of course, assuming that the miners themselves are flagging support for segregated witness. And I, I've said this a couple times. I think what needs to happen on that front is that the miners and, and, and people that just give a shit about it you know, if you care enough about it to bitch at somebody on Twitter, then, for Christ's sake, fire up a miner. It doesn't even have to be a really efficient one. It just has to put some hashing power on the network. That's all it's got to do. And you can support whatever variant of Bitcoin you want. And you know what? If we got a 95 percent consensus, we could kick segregated witness right back off the network again. Oh, nobody thought about that. Nobody bothers to talk about that. Nobody bothers to talk about the fact that there are variants of Bitcoin that are live right now that do not have segregated witness in them. And I'm not just talking about Bitcoin Cash and and the the quote unquote forks. But I mean, pre-existing forks that didn't just make their own coins. There are other implementations of Bitcoin that are live right now. And if you look them up, I think it's on, um, it's not on Coin Wars. Oh, fuck. 
I, I can't remember the website now, but if you're if you're into that kind of thing, you probably know which one I'm talking about. And and if you do look it up, you know, if you want to look it up, like the uh, percentage of miners per per implementation of Bitcoin, they have all those stats on there. And I can't Coin Dance. That's it. Go to Coin Dance and, and check it out. If you see a, a, a variant of Bitcoin or an implementation of Bitcoin that that flags support for BIPs you like and ones and doesn't flag support for ones that you don't put some hashing power toward it you might be on you might be able to generate enough hashing power to push consensus I mean that that's how this game is meant to be played folks it, it's not meant to be played from the sideline and from fucking Twitter it's fire up some miners I mean and I'm telling you that's on my list that's on my to-do list as soon as I get out and get out from under some other obligations I gotta rectify first kind of get out of my way but definitely it's it's within a, a not so distant period of time I might want to hold off only because of the article that I'm gonna read here here now but it, it will only be contingent on when these things actually come out. And uh, this article is on Cointelegraph.com. 2018 could be banner year for NVIDIA miners. And this is by Gareth Jenkinson uh, from the picture and the name. Yes, penis. While Bitcoin and various altcoins enjoyed a record-breaking 2017... Chip makers like NVIDIA also benefited from the crypto boom. The graphics card manufacturer was the top performer on the S&P 500 in the chip manufacturer category. Overall, NVIDIA's share price saw a 100% rise in 2017 and Goldman Sachs believes that growth will bubble. Uh, I'm sorry, will bubble continue into 2008? Jesus Christ, dude. Do some fucking editing. I'll, I'll try and assemble that properly here. And Goldman Sachs believes that this growth will continue to bubble into 2018. As reported by CNBC, Goldman Sachs analyst Tasha Yari, Hari, rather, my apologies, told clients that they could expect chip makers to have another bumper year on the stock market. I believe they are correct. NVIDIA is one of the few stocks in our, our coverage universe exposed to multiple secular growth markets. With the emergence of eSports and the potential proliferation of VR slash AR, we, uh, we view gaming as a meaningful and sustainable growth driver for the overall company. In terms of single stock, our top picks in in semis and semi cap are Nvidia and Antigris. Um, yeah, Antigris. Growth in the gaming sector is expected to drive up the company's share price by seven percent, according to Harry. A big factor in this projected growth was the recent launch of Nvidia's new Volta powered Titan Five graphics card. On December of 2017, Titan 5 results. There was plenty of hype ahead of the, the eventual launch of the Titan 5. For $3,000, you could snap one up at this very moment, although you can only order two at a time on the NVIDIA website. The chip has 5,120 CUDA cores. 640 tensor cores and 12 gigabytes of memory making it the most powerful PC GPU produced to date. Nvidia claims Volta is nine times more powerful than its previous architecture Pascal. Avid gamers who were ready to drop that amount of cash on a new GPU have already had a go with the new card. According to them the results are impressive. I should certainly fucking hope so. A Reddit user posted a long list of games he'd benchmarked for the Titan V, all of which demonstrate impressive results. He benchmarked the Titan V at about 64 
and mega hashes per second with better hash, which is 25 mega hashes per second more than the 1080 Ti, according to another user. Patience is a virtue. The best technology often comes with the heftiest of price tags, and this is the case with the Titan V. Avid gamers who plan to mine cryptocurrency on the side might wait for NVIDIA's consumer version of the card. In the past, NVIDIA has launched their flagship professional gaming cards, which were followed by more affordable, slightly less powerful consumer-grade cards. The latest example was the NVIDIA Titan, which birthed the 1080 Ti. The consumer-oriented 1080 Ti had slightly fewer CUDA cores and 11 GB of memory instead of the Titan's 12 GB. NVIDIA cracked down on non-miners. As noted by the register, NVIDIA will ban the use of its GeForce and Titan cards in data centers around the world. Fortunately for miners, they are unaffected by these changes. The latest NVIDIA GeForce license agreements reads, No data center deployment. The software is not licensed for data center development, except that blockchain processing in a data center is permitted. <laughs> wow. I am getting the broadest range of conflicting signals from I NVIDIA, like, ever. I mean, I, I swear, not not two months ago, they were downplaying their their estimates for what they would be making in the cryptocurrency mining space. You know, they, they were like, oh, you know, we're not sure this is really going to be around all that much longer, so, you know, we're not going to really bother, and pff, bullshit. Now what they have to do, what they have to do is make these to where they are, they are headless cards, you know, to where they, they're not fucking up all their gamers by restricting the supply by making them available to both gamers and miners. Because it will be years before the fucking gamers see these fucking things if that's the case. You know, if NVIDIA just keeps it with one one production chain of, of it, of that card, you know, where it's it's only going to be designed just for gaming, it's not going to be stripped down just for mining, you know, we're not going to have a stripped down model for mining, or a streamlined model for mining, um, we're just going to have the one universal model and make everybody pay $3,000 a fucking video card, Jesus Christ, I don't know that that additional 50 mega hashes a second is really going to be worth it, man, I mean, Come on now. Give me a break. I mean, I I suppose with maybe a smaller cap coin, it would probably be worth it. You know, something like Verge. But anyway, that these are the kind of considerations I'm thinking of with regard to jumping into mining. See, these guys tell you straight out. You might want to wait for the consumer models just because, so what, they're a little teeny tiny bit slower than the professional ones, but you could probably buy four of them for the same price that you could buy the professional one for. So, it's a trade-off either way. You know, you could buy two of the one or four of the other. Or, actually, eight of the other because it was, yeah. And, and, and I, I don't know, I... You tell me, do you think you're going to get more hashing power out of two video cards or eight of them? It's not a contest, folks. It's not a contest at all. Let the gamers have the first round of them. So what? You're going to get a little bit of a bump, but you're only going to be ordering them two at a time. And by the time you get enough of them together, the consumer models are going to be out and you're going to be asked out all of that additional hashing power that you would have gotten if you just held off for just a teeny tiny. However, in all honesty, I think this is a poor tactical mood for NVIDIA. And again, I haven't investigated far enough into this. I would be willing to bet that NVIDIA was smart enough to make mining cards specifically. But if they weren't, that is such a fucking drop of the ball, dude. Such a drop of the ball. Because I, I think it was last year or um, 
It was either late last year or, or yeah, mid mid two thousand seventeen. I started hearing rumbles of headless video cards, and these I think they were going to be put out by AMD or one of those guys, and that that is so far ahead of where this is going to go. I think, you know, I mean, if you were to take a comparable chipset from say AMD you know, and slap it onto a card that is streamlined specifically for mining, right? Just maximize for inefficiency for that purpose alone. That They're going to blow these guys out of the water. The, this price point of $3,000, it's probably going to, it probably will drive a lot of miners off of it because despite the, the additional hashing power, you could probably buy 10 fucking... 1080 Ti class cards for one of these cards, and I mean, so what? It's going to be more more electricity, but you're still going to be breaking. You're going to be beating break even for as many of these cards as you can get for the same amount of money. So, I I don't know that this is this is the best tactical move for the, for Nvidia really. Um. I mean, unless they're that much further ahead of everybody else with with regard to, you know, performance specs and whatnot on their vi on their video cards, I don't see them maintaining this position for very long. You know, I think that either the secondary market built building on their their same architectures or a competing architecture will will bloom up out of nowhere and, and blow them out of the water. But I I don't think that anybody who who doesn't have a competing amount of, of production capacity would ever be able to displace NVIDIA. Um, I, I think there there are a few potentials, but I don't know. They would have to get serious and like put together a concerted effort. You know, like AMD would have to, you know, shit can one of their their uh, processor CPU plants and retool it for GPUs. And, be, and dedicate it to nothing but cranking out headless video cards to be able to keep up, I think. But the the price point is that that's a that's a tender spot, you know, three thousand bucks, and and only being able to get two of them at a time. That's that's tough, 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 tough. But it, it does show us that. You know these guys are getting serious. They're taking they're taking mining seriously. You know that they're even, that anybody's even bothering to benchmark these things for mining. But I I expect this trend to continue on. I I don't I don't expect it to stop with them. But it, it won't take too long before an arms race between Nvidia and and like AMD or Motorola or Samsung or one of these other guys making a, a significant run for competition against NVIDIA, uh, that would be it for ASICs. Because the arms race between two major chip manufacturers like them, forget about it. Forget about it. We're going to blow the, the Moore's Law curve as these guys are digging deeper and deeper and deeper into their fucking R&D trove, bringing that stuff out to production sooner than they'd anticipated on their on their graphs and whatnot, because now they're they're making breakthroughs every other second now, you know. And before they they know it, they've got three more iterations under their belt to come out, and those are going to come out sooner. <laughs> we are going to start a major arms race. We are going to see a an exponential bump in efficiency. And I I think it might be with new dopants. I, I I haven't heard too much about um, chip manufacturers messing around with dopants lately. I think the last time I'd I'd read about anybody getting really serious with uh, tweaking their uh, their silicon substrates or the uh, the composition of them. Um, I don't know. It was like 
I want to say like five or ten years ago, somewhere between there, that that I had heard that they were really messing with dopants to try and make them more efficient. So I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's time we see that kind of bump. Or you know, there's always that specter of of quantum computing. You know, somewhere in the background. You know, maybe uh, GPUs will go quantum on us and. That'll be the thing that blows ASICs out of the water. I don't know, but I, I'm telling you right now, the dominance that ASIC machines currently have in the mining space, it's of a limited duration. And and I know what ASIC stands for, and, and I'm telling you that there there were other iterations of mining that that seemed like they were gonna be around for a lot longer than they were. <laughs> before they were displaced by ASICs. So, again, I, I don't think that ASICs are the only thing. Now, I think I've commented on this show once or twice before about the Sony cell processor. Um, that That's one of those that it, it showed a lot of promise. There was a lot of hype. And then, for whatever reason, they just they gave up on it. And I, I never bothered to trace back whether or not they're actually using those chips in anything. But one of the things that I liked about them was that if you had them in close proximity to one another, they would distribute the processing load between the devices. So say you had a smart TV with one of these cell processors and you had some sort of opti- op- optical media device that had a cell processor in it, maybe a PS4 or PS5 or whatever the fuck it is and maybe your fridge or fridge had a uh, cell processor in it and your microwave has a cell processor in it and so all four of them working in kind of a uh, kind of a little micro mesh network kind of thing would distribute the processing power between them like depending on which one you were using and I, I thought that was a really neat idea I mean that wasn't the only dependent factor but I thought it was a really neat idea, and then along came mining, and I, I noticed, though, that the architecture for them, I, I looked up that kind of thing, because, you know, I used to work in a fab, and uh, and so the, the idea of the, you know, the basic architecture kind of stuck in my mind, and then I think I looked up the architecture for um, an ASIC chip, and they looked a lot alike. Not saying they're identical or anything like that, but they looked a lot, some, a lot more similar than I'd anticipated, and so you know, it makes me wonder if the cell processor wasn't abandoned for maybe mining or something to that effect. Although it seemed to me that that the cell processor died before mining became a a thing, actually before cryptocurrencies became anything. But yeah, so NVIDIA, they're definitely putting a foot forward um, on what I see as the beginning of the next arms race in, in mining. And, and like I said, I think it will it will not be long before they're kicking the shit out of ASICs. I mean, especially if they get like Intel or, or AMD or Motorola or any of these guys, any of the bigger chip manufacturers um, in direct competition with them. Forget about it. It's... It, it's going to be off to the races. And, uh, yeah, like I said, we are going to see a, a push on efficiency and whatnot in, in actual output that we haven't seen before. And it, it's funny how, how Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are providing the exact kind of incentive to drive that kind of development. And, I mean, the, the gamers, they should be happy as fuck. You know, I mean, it... They, they could be all pissed off right now, okay, because they can't get these video cards for, for less than a kidney. But that's beside the point. The fact of the matter is, is that one of the side effects of mining is that we are causing them to up their development cycle. And we are causing them to dig down deep into their brain power and try and pull out the, the next big fastest chip. And the next big fastest way to do things, I mean, like the addition of all these cores, that's that seems kind of new to me. I I hadn't <clears throat> really paid attention too much to video cards, but I mean, I, I'd never heard of video cards in the hundreds of 
processors. That's that's pretty significant, or hundreds of cores rather. So again, I think that in another two years, gamers are going to be thanking us. VR people are going to be thanking us. AR people are going to be thanking us um, because we are we are pushing the fold on on the on video video card performance. You know, it, it was for a very short period of time that that uh, tablets were driving. Uh, what is it? The camera camera technology, where everybody wanted a tablet with a with a higher resolution camera, and so it's you know this one's got eight megapixels, and that one's got twelve megapixels, and this one's got twenty one megapixels, and so on and so forth. We're going to see the same thing now with GPUs. And video card, you know, just the the units. We're going to see that same push, but it, it's mining that's driving it. It's the desire to get more bang for the buck out of your video card that's going to be driving it. But one of the ancillary effects is that we are going to be causing NVIDIA to be pushing out way faster cards than anybody's writing video game, games for. And it, it will be now that it's it's video game editors and, and authors and whatnot or uh, developers, they're going to be diving into just an ocean worth of resources now, whereas they've been driving the, the performance for video cards. So, you know, as you might expect, because it's just video games, I mean, sure, there's, there's some that are some people that are are competitively paying, playing video games but there are a really finite number of people by comparison to the number of people that play video games in total and so they, when you're talking about somebody who's willing to throw down a thousand dollars for a fucking video card you're talking about a really finite niche market whereas with video cards what? You can make it a little bit faster if you do this to it. Then yeah, do that to it. I'll pay the extra two hundred and fifty bucks because that's going to be, you know, another three thousand, four thousand dollars for me this next month during mining. And so you know, I'm willing to put down the money for it now. And and that's the change there. You know, it's because the the contribution that your hardware can provide to enhancing my processes actually puts more money in my pocket so that motivates me to come to you and say hey when do you get the next model out I need to plan ahead I want to know when you're going to be having the next model in boxes and ready to ship you know you're like calling around to to different plants to figure out which one is the nearest one to you that's going to have their their production cycle completed and in boxes to get it shipped to you faster. Well, you know, the, Nvidia can only put up with that for, for so long before they're they're looking at that di- additional demand and going, "All right, this is flooding our consum- our customer service department. You know, people want to know where they can get more of our cards, and the gamers are are like." marching the street with pitchforks and fucking torches because they can't get any video cards because the miners keep buying up all of them and they're out for our hides we got to do something to address this additional demand (laughs) you know and and that's that's where we're at that's why we're seeing these kind of bumps And, and you know i i've mentioned that i think that eventually mining is going to end up saving the planet because we are going to drive computing to become so fucking efficient that with minimal resources and probably using additive manufacturing technologies technologies instead of subtractive we are going to make computing so cheap and so efficient that the demands that we place on the planet for the next iteration of video card or whatever it's not going to demand things like you know, deforesting the Congo and, and enslaving tribes to dig the shit out of the ground and stupid shit like that. I think that the level of wealth that we can be bringing to the world economies 
and I say economies plural because I, I don't believe we're we're going to come to a mono economy. I think I think you might be able to view it from an outside perspective as a mono economy because it won't be nationalistic at all. It'll be dependent on the volume and quality of products that you're able to produce. I mean, there, there's been this growing interest in kind of cottage industry products, you know, so like limited run clothing and stuff like that, that is produced by, you know, people with their hands and not not machines and robots and shit like that. And we're seeing we're seeing a increase in the price point for such things. And I think that in the not so distant future we're going to see the folly of just in time manufacturing because no matter how fast you can get it through your production your your production line it still takes time to get it from China to the market you know and so I, I think we're going to see space or distance cut out of the equation because it's a major bottleneck at this point Especially considering that with 3D printing, all you got to do is fucking email the, the specs or instant message the specs to somebody 8,000 miles away. And if they've got the production capacity, they can make it right there on site. Think about that one. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And I have not selected anything, but I've been feeling the need for some sixth. And so here it is. Vivid. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Slayer with Exile. I don't know, when I hear that song, I think to myself, somebody really, 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 really pissed Tom off. Because, I mean, it's like, I don't know that I've ever, I don't know, there, there's, I don't know anybody in my life currently that makes me want to exile them from my life that's just like that's that's like some deep hatred there <laughs> you know <laughs> you know that's like i really don't want to see you ever again <laughs> but you know how we were talking about uh how a little bump on the lower end might give NVIDIA's gambit for the really high-end video card miners a run for their money. And I think this this could be a possible candidate. We never know. I, I don't know the power specs and all that, so I couldn't say conclusively. However, any mention of a competitor is better than none. And I think this is, this is potential. These guys have been around for a while. Gigabyte announces... P104-100 4G mining graphics card. And uh, this was this is a little older. It's approximately 2 weeks ago. This is by Ron Perlo. No picture, but I'm going to go by the name Yes Penis. Gigabyte is introducing their latest video card specifically for the use in cryptocurrency mining. The Gigabyte P104-100 4G lacks the usual display outputs associated with a normal graphics card. However, the P104-100 is built specifically for another job entirely. Each card comes equipped with 4 gigabytes of 100... What's that? 10,010... Megahertz G GDDR 5x memory on a 256-bit interface. The P104 100 GPU has 1920 vi NVIDIA CUDA cores and operates at 1607 megahertz base clock speed. NVIDIA launched the P104-100 GPU for miners back in June of 2017. It is based on the GP100-100 GPU, GP100-A1 GPU built on the 16 on the 16 nanometer process. Hmm, not bad. 
but since the Gigabyte's mining mining video card with other P104-100 video cards is its WinForce 3X cooling system. This is the same cooling design they use for their gaming video card line. Underneath these 90mm fans with a unique 3D blade design is a triple copper heat sink. The heat sink uses a direct contact design for optimal efficient thermal transfers. Having three fans also helps lower the noise while providing adequate cooling superior to blower style designs. The P104 comes with a base clock of 1607 MHz and boasts up to 1733 MHz overclocked to the gills I'm sure burning like a supernova in your case. It requires a single 8-pin PSU power connector and is a dual slot height video card. <clears throat> However, Gigabyte only put a single row rear sorry, single row rear IO cover with per perforations for ventilation. Each P104-100 crypto mining accelerator comes with a three-year warranty. Hmm, that's comforting. I mean, that, <clears throat> that's a pretty impressive looking video card. I mean, they've got it expanded far enough to where they can uh, fit three fans on it as opposed to two. So I'd imagine it would run just a teeny tiny cooler. But yeah, looking at it um, appearance-wise, it does not have the usual interfaces for for video output. I'm sure it's got like an HDMI plug on it or some shit like that. But... Uh, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Um, now, it doesn't give us, like, hash rate estimates. Let's see here. Ooh. Oh, that's an interesting one. We might we might follow that up. Sorry, there was a link on there. Anyway, um, you know, I, I think this is, this is the kind of competition that I'm talking about because it, it didn't seem like those NVIDIA cards that we were talking about earlier, as impressive as they seemed, uh, that there was any of them that was going to be dedicated specifically for the purpose of mining. And this means that the the same supply of, of cards is going to be addressing two different constituencies of users, miners and gamers, and making them compete on the same price level. And I, I don't think that's fair. I mean, for, for one thing, I think it's going to set back video video gaming just a teeny tiny because they're going to be waiting for miners to recycle their hardware. They're not necessarily going to be releasing games for, you know, the, the latest and greatest video card being released. Either that or we could see NVIDIA get supplanted on either end. You know, Gigabyte on one end, although... They are basing their shit on NVIDIA's processor, so really how far divided can you get, or separated rather. Now, if NVIDIA isn't the only uh, the only manufacturer of those the of the chipsets for these, I, I could see a point there where you know they could they could receive competition from that end. But it all depends on, you know, who, who owns the patents, what the licensing is on it, and so on and so forth. But I, I think this is, this is the kind of disruption that, that we've needed to happen. Because I think the video game, uh, the, the guys that have been making video cards, they've been intransigent with regard to addressing mining. And, and it's really foolish considering how much electricity and how much capital gets dedicated to mining every year. I think it's fucking ludicrous. I mean, if I were, if I had the means to fire up a fab on my own, I'd hire global foundries, right? I'd be like, yo, I got this facility. I want you to renovate it for, you know, the next iteration of whatever fucking ASICs or the next iteration of something you know GPUs you know 7 nanometer fucking GPUs or some shit like that 
and and I want it done yesterday. You know, just flood the fucking market with them. And, and I would go gigabytes route with. I I put out. I I would probably put out two lines, though. I would put out ones that were specifically for video cards for gaming. And then some that were specifically mining cards. And I'd probably be getting rich just licensing out my architectures for each. You know, and the setups for each. I, I think it's silly that uh, that people aren't taking this mining thing more seriously. Because we got to get the cost down. You know, but like I said, I think, I think we're reaching so far up these companies' R&D trees that... You know, they're, they're like, well, we need to hire a whole bunch of fucking engineers to get a next iteration of this shit because in two years at this rate, we're going to be completely out of everything that we've got in the fucking R&D cabinet and we're not rebuilding that shit fast enough. <laughs> you know? But, the, I don't know, I think this is a, uh, this is a result of, like, outsourcing. I think that if manufacturing were expected to be something that that we just directly competed with or if, or if other country, countries could afford to compete on the same level that uh, say China or or Korea or Malaysia um, how they they kind of skirt their ecologic concerns <laughs> and I mean you, you can see how that looks in in China, the the little footage that has gone out, you know, on days that they haven't bothered to try and clean the air so that it makes it look good for everybody, um, you know, it looks to me it looks like a rain cloud right in the middle of the town, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, pea soup. I mean, you can't you can't tell me that that's worth it, but I mean, supposedly it is. You know that over in China they are seeing a greater interest in renewables, which is a it's something I really wish we would do here in the United States on a grander scale. I mean, we do it quietly, and it, it's really funny. It's like they they do it, but they don't really talk about it. You know, it's just like all of a sudden you'll see wind farms as part of the scenery in a movie. It's like, okay, well, where the fuck are those wind farms? Well, this is supposedly happening in Montana, so <laughs> you know, I got to assume the fucking windmill, the the wind farms are in Montana. You know, I mean that's just a for instance. I don't know that they actually do harvest the wind in Montana. They probably should. But you know, I I live in a state where we have a persistent Pacific wind coming in one direction, three hundred and sixty-five days a year. I mean, it's a rarity that you could go down to the Oregon coast and not have a persistent seven mile an hour wind. Minimum. And and it changes throughout the day. But I mean, in an average day, it gets up there, you know, 10, 15 miles an hour. That's more than enough to power the entire state of Oregon. So, you know, why we aren't taking advantage of that, that's just, it's very disappointing to me. You know, but I, I think that in the not so distant future, that's not going to be true. That we are going to be utilizing it because, bang for the buck wise, we can get the most out of it. And I think that, again, it will be in our best interest in the 21st century to make electricity as ubiquitous as roads, internet access as ubiquitous as roads. You can use it. You could not use it. It's there all the time. It's there for you to access freely and get to where you need to go and do what you need to do because the commerce that it enables will be worth it. It will be worth it to connect you to merchants all over the planet because everybody gets little kickbacks. You know, in, in either transferring the IP or transferring the information or transferring the money or the transferring the medium, everybody gets little kickbacks. And that, that's cool. You know, that's how it should work. 
You know what I mean? If you're if you're dutifully carrying my fucking object from point A to point B, B being me, yeah, you know, I don't I don't mind, you know, paying you a little shipping and handling. That's cool. You know, and, and to that point, that stuff's getting way more efficient. You know, and I think this is one of those points in history where we can like skip a period with regard to a technological advancement. You know, I mean, so far we've been using drones for like recreational stuff, and there are some industrial applications. But I think on the delivery spectrum, you know, this is this is the the place where we really need to be facilitating drones rather than. <clears throat> Using them abroad for for interdiction purposes or whatever I don't I don't even know I don't rather than using that kind of facility for that you know it's like I I commented about this one thing I I saw it say a little handheld drone right and the guy throws it in the air and it it's got like its own little AI and a targeting system and all this shit. And it, it targets the dummy right there on the stage and flies into it and blows a blows the head like clean off, right? And I'm thinking to myself this whole time, it's like, okay, in his hand is all the technology I that that is needed in order to craft something about the size of, of my minivan that I can fly to from point A to point B. All the technology is right there. I mean the, the the AI on board could could tell whether or not I was getting too close to houses or the ground or whatever. It could be putting put to a different purpose, you know, instead of trying to run into stuff, it could try and keep you from running into stuff. That's that'd be pretty cool, huh? But the point being is all of the technology to enable you and me to fly wherever the fuck we want to go whenever we want to go there is in this dude's hand and rather than using it for that we're trying to blow people's heads off from 8,000 miles away from with a little remote drone that you can throw from your hand <laughs> that's just that that's just lunacy to me there's so much more wonder that could be derived out of that technology than it, than military utilization. But here we are. We're trying to fucking kill one another with that shit. <laughs> I mean, it's like we, we, we haven't, like, evolved past that point. You know, it's like as soon as we figured out we could bonk stuff upside the head with a fucking stick, we were trying to kill one another with it. <laughs> So, <laughs> apparently that hasn't changed. But on, on back onto this mining front, I think that that is a proper utilization of this drive. You know, it's like we have a drive to compete with one another, and it's incentivized through cryptocurrencies, and not just in one cryptocurrency, but among thousands. That, that we could pick up at any time, you know, set up a little account on one of the pools and dedicate what resources we do have to the process of mining on some coin. And I, I think that one of the problems that, that people face when they're looking at it is that they're looking for an immediate gain. You know, they, they look at that spike and they're just like, oh, wow, you know, I could have been making so much money and they throw down a whole bunch of money to to mine and whatnot. And next thing you know, that thing goes through a dip and they're like, oh, my God, you know, they're completely soured on it because, you know, they're leveraged to the hilt buying these fucking video cards at three thousand dollars a pop. And <laughs> and now, you know, they're, they're facing the the altcoin winner not knowing which which fucking coin to mine next because they're all dropping in value so fast <laughs> and he gets completely soured on the experience but it's only because he's looking at an immediate turnaround you know 
and I, I think that having that kind of perspective with regard to cryptocurrencies is it's unfortunate because what you really need to be doing is taking a hard look at the coins themselves and saying do I want to support this do I think this this project is worthy of my electricity my bandwidth my capital investment in hardware and if so then don't worry about what you're going to make on it today just mine the fucking thing and what you do make on it you know don't immediately sell your coins try and try and like wait for a little bit a little bit of mine and hodl i know people advise against that but <laughs> if you were to look at bitcoin <laughs> over a six month period especially this last last six month period and think about it from a mining perspective you know if, if like five months ago you were mining bitcoin and you were living hand to mouth by selling your bitcoin for us dollars and putting that into your bank account and then buying everything with it right if you were doing that with your bitcoin rather than using what bitcoin you did manage to mine as like secondary income and rather than spending it immediately just putting that shit in cold storage you know just on, on your mining account you put a goddamn a, a paper wallet in address and there's your receive address and you just beam fucking coins straight to it and then six months later you take those coins <clears throat> you import them to the current version of the wallet and then you put them on the exchange and you make a significant profit on them I mean that that's just how it goes and, and and you can question it and you can you can say oh no that's, that's all bullshit but take a good look at the coins out there if the project was worth the shit and you were able to mine it above your above your electricity at least your electricity considerations um you're you're set by now 6 months after that you know if you were to have started 6 months ago Look at look at fucking Verge. It's gone up shit. In six months it's gone up I wanna say like twelve hundred percent or something. Not not twelve hundred, but I mean a lot. Like a lot. You know, like hundred and twenty times or something. Just a fucking extreme amount. And if you were mining it six months ago and you didn't spend the coins, you just fucking threw them into a fucking paper wallet and we're trying to turn them around now you'd be making a significant profit on your initial investment you know I, I told a, a friend this the other day because they're they're keenly interested in getting in the mining game I said look just establish a connection just establish a connection make sure that they're receiving your work you're receiving fucking new block you're receiving other people's blocks it, make sure things are working right hammer it down and then get into the the uh, uh, what do you call them the facts and learn how to make what you're doing more d work more efficiently you know things like overclocking your cards um, picking the right software to make make your cards work the best upgrading your card drivers so on and so forth little tweaks to improve your performance and that way, in six months, when you're ready to roll over your hardware based on what you made off of your coins, you are going to be mentally prepared. You're going to have a plan. In six months, if you're, if you're actually being attentive as a miner, instead of just letting the shit run and heat up your fucking house or whatever, by being attentive, learning the nomenclature, watching for releases of new hardware new software you'll be properly attuned mentally to get serious about that shit or at least more serious about it six months later if you were accumulating your coins that whole time instead of spending them 
you will more than likely have enough monetary value saved up in those coins to be able to exchange them for real or I, I shouldn't say real cash. Hopefully by then you'll be able to just spend them as fucking cash as is. But that's neither here nor there. And I, I've actually thought about how to do that properly with paying taxes. But again, we're not going there. But I, I really think that if you did that, if you followed that that line, first six months, don't even fucking harvest your coins. Just fucking throw them into a paper wallet. Ignore them. Bring them online after six months when you're when you're ready to review your possible profits. See how much you're willing to liquidate, how much you want to huddle, and move up on your your mining rig. You know, if you were mining with two cards this this time around, next six months try and get in four, maybe six. You know, but you're again work your efficiencies. Like I was saying earlier about uh, about those new whiz bang cards, you know, w- what's it worth to you throwing down three thousand dollars for one card if you can get more hashing power out of three of ten eighty TIs at, at like you know what, like two to three hundred bucks a piece? Hey, why why would you do that? You know, you could you could easily outrun one of these cards, and and so what? It's going to save you on efficiency, but there is going to be a break even point where these these cards are going to get replaced by the consumer grade cards that are going to be half as much and maybe only slightly less powerful. But if you were to buy those six months later, when when they're out on the market. You'd be in a prime position to go transition straight to those and be kicking the shit out of the people that were the initial investors in those those cards to begin with. Paying three thousand dollars a fucking card. That's that's just fucking ludicrous to me. A video card, three thousand dollars. I mean do do you have any idea what kind of system I could build with three thousand dollars? I mean I, I could be directing NASA from this fucking desktop with three thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, you know, we plotting flight paths of s- satellites and shit. Oh yeah, we're gonna crash into something. We better thrust a little here, thrust a little there. Point. Uh, not that I'm technically capable of that, but point being that it would be powerful enough to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, throwing throwing that much down on a video card. I, I guess if you're you're that close to it that it, you can make it cheap enough or you you can buy the volume of them up front that you can make it worth it okay i mean i think if you were mining with them for 6 months you you would get a big enough jump on on people potentially strategic that if you weren't burning your coins that when the consumer grade ones come out that you could just replace the ones you currently have with the consumer grade ones sure you're going to be paying more with electricity but the increase in hashing power would be worth it <clears throat> but you know I'm I'm sure I'm just preaching to the choir to somebody out there they're like dude I th- you're talking about my life that's like six months and we're going to do it again in a month <laughs> I'm sure that that person exists, but I'm not really speaking to them. I'm speak well as much. Sorry, guys. I, I'm I'm speaking to the guys that are that are going to be competing with you, you know, because that's the kind of space that this is. And I'm sure if anybody's oriented with it, it's you. You know. But as I I, I see it, th- this is something that is meant for all of us to participate in. You know, the idea of centralization of mining being in any one place, it's a temporary aberration. Get over it. You know, it's like I, I had the same discussion with somebody the other day, and I was like, look, the, the mining was at one time primarily done in the United States. Did anybody bitch about centralization of mining when it was in the United States? No. Are, are they going to bitch when it concentrates in Russia? They shouldn't. Not if their transactions are going through just as fast as ever, if not faster. I mean, because that would be the point of 
going with them, right? They provided some competitive advantage to you. You know, they could afford to sell their coins for cheaper. And so, of course, you went with them. <clears throat> but that that's how this game is supposed to work, is you are supposed to be operating out of your own drives, you know, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider others in those, you know. It's like that, that whole tendency to climb the ladder and then burn it. <laughs> that's kind of actually that's antithetical to what we're doing here because at one point or another you might have to start over and why should you make it harder for yourself to start over than it was for you to start initially that just doesn't make any sense and I mean sure you might have some relationships that cut the learning curve for starting over down just a teeny tiny the fact is there are people that didn't stop playing you know during the time that you were your your downtime or whatever they weren't they didn't stop playing and so they're they're current on the on everything going on and you're going to be playing catch up and it's not hard to do once once you've got some of the learning curve down but it's hard enough that you only want to do it so many times got to keep trying to run with it and i mean i i let mining get away from me and I, I really regret it because it was something that I I believed in you know it's like I'm participating in a project that I believe in that will potentially be very 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 profitable for me and a lot of other people that currently don't have those sources of revenue and, and that's that's how it's turned out to be and I I really like to see it continue be that way being that way only because i i've seen how it's changed some people's lives and you know why why wouldn't you want that to happen you know i mean it, it just blows me away i keep talking about the the guy that told me about the fifty six thousand dollar tip i gave him my this is fucking incredible to me it wasn't worth fifty six thousand dollars when i gave it to him it was worth more like 56 cents <laughs> you know if that it was like 5.6 cents or point point oh five six cents <laughs> it was, certainly wasn't worth $56,000 anyway, I've had people hit me up on Twitter they're like dude got any other big tips to hand out and I'm like dude I, it wasn't that big when I handed it out <laughs> you know I mean, shit, if, if those same people were in, in the IRC room way back in the day, they, pff, they would have gotten that rained on them in a week. But, you know, it's it's one of those things where hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, it's like, it, as soon as it, it broke, like, you know, point oh oh one penny, some people just fucking liquidated <clears throat> you know, took their their two hundred bucks and ran, <laughs> and and they're probably just kicking themselves in the ass. I know I am, at least you know. Because I mean, at one time I had like fifteen million of them, but you know, again, I couldn't see what was coming, and I would. I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about Verge. <laughs> fifteen million Bitcoin. Jesus Christ. Could you imagine living that high on the hog? I mean, I, I'd definitely be living that dream of, you know, New Zealand being my island again. <laughs> be like, that's my island. I bought it. <laughs> y'all y'all can stay. <laughs> but it's optional. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the I think that... Uh, we're, we're coming into a really interesting time, and I think that mining is going to be a really big part of it. And I think public mining, less than really big conglomerates, is going to be a, a shift that we see in 2018. Because people are looking at the, the current people that, are, that have all the hashing power, and they're saying, you know, I don't necessarily agree with you, you know? 
maybe I, I want to support BIPs that you don't currently like. And, you know, maybe you'll like them later when you see that more people like them. So, I'm going to express my will with my minors. And that's what I'm saying about shifting the consensus. It takes you to do something for people to want to emulate you. They don't emulate your thoughts. They emulate what you do. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And we played some sixth. We've hit up Slayer, but we have not hit up any corn. And I think it is time. And so, got the life for those of you who have been doing especially well. Here it is Corn, got the life here on Coin Metal. And that was the infectious grooves with. These freaks are here to party. <sighs> and so, as we've been talking about the GPU end of cryptocurrency mining, I think it is worth mentioning this concern recently about China having a clampdown on mining. Um, I don't know how real this is. Uh, th there have been rumors floating around for at least, I want to say, six months now, ever since the uh, the IC ICO clinch there in uh, China. There have been murmurs of possible clampdowns on mining in China. Now, personally, I believe they are FUD. And I'll tell you why. Number one... We've been through this with China before. We've been through this not once, but I believe twice now with China where they have said, we're going to ban Bitcoin and, and then nothing happens. You know, we are going to ban ICO and for the most part, quote unquote, legitimate traders or traders that don't want to bother risking the, the possibility of getting caught stay out of it, but the vast, the, the vast majority of the ones that were already dealing in ICOs stayed in ICOs. So, you know, w what is this really telling us? The likelihood that China is going to clamp down and kick themselves out of cryptocurrencies, I think, is nil. They have too many interests. Too many they manufacture chips. What do you need in mining? You need chips. Whether they be GPU chipsets or ASIC chipsets or whatever the next iteration of Bitcoin chipsets, whatever. Point being is you need hardware for that. They make hardware there. That's a major interest. Number two, they have expanding energy capacities. Not just in coal, but also in renewables. So, again, this makes them attra an attractive site for mining because of cheap electricity. That, compounded with the proximity to mining capacity, i.e. additional chips, and it becomes increasingly advantageous to be concentrated in China. However, this this fuckery with with China's government where the 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 people's you know government or whatever comes out of the darkness and says oh we're going to clamp down on cryptocurrencies you know the the market's just getting sick of this shit you know it's like either you know e either shit or get off the pot you know stay stay in the game and and participate openly in shit or or get the fuck out Playing it both ways like this isn't helping anybody, least of all your people, because as tolerant as the market has been, and it has been very, very tolerant, I don't expect that that will stay the same in the future. I think that there are other municipalities that produce far more electricity per capita, and between the lowering energy consumption of their consumables and 
the increasing interest in mining, I think that your position as as dominant provider of hashing powers it, it it's got a narrow window and a narrowing one at that and i i think this next article kind of exemplifies that <clears throat> china's bitcoin miners moving to avoid clampdown and this was author this is on uh, altcoincalendar.info uh january 7th 2018 by mark lyford um, I'm going by the name, but yes, penis. China's crackdown on cryptocurrencies has widened to miners, according to a Bloomberg report. What? Bloomberg? Continuing on. Officials plan to limit the power consumption to the industry and have asked local governments to guide miners out of the business. <coughs> more like guide miners out of China. The People's Bank of China intends to enforce local regulators to monitor and restrict power use of miners, which are often located near hydroelectric power plants. Bitmain, which runs China's two largest Bitcoin mining collectives, is relocating its headquarters to Singapore, according to the report. Company co-founder uh, Jihan Wu said that they already have mining operations in the U.S. and Canada. Bitmain is not only mining is not the only mining operation to leave Chinese shores. The third largest BTC top is opening a factory in Canada, and the fourth biggest mining operation via BTC has facilities in Iceland and the U.S. BTC top founder Jiang Zauer said they, that they chose Canada because of the relatively cheap cost and the stability of the country and its policies. Locations in Russia and Iran were also considered. Power Hungry China has long been a haven for cryptocurrency mining due to its low cost of energy. It, is, it also has the advantage of cheap labor and local chip manufacturing. Bitcoin mining uses a lot of energy. It has been estimated that Digicom bit estimated by Digiconomist Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index that the current estimated annual electricity consumption is 37.8 tera tera terawatt hours. My apologies. It was also estimated that 3.5, uh, I'm sorry, 3 to 5 million households in the U.S. could be powered by Bitcoin mining, which equates to an annualized estimated global mining cost of 1.8 G billion. Uh, I don't know what that means. 1.8 G billion. <laughs> okay. Bitcoin currently uses more energy per year than several countries, including Bulgaria and Denmark. According to the report, the problems do not end there as Bitcoin's biggest problem is not just its massive energy consumption, but that the network is mostly fueled by coal-fired power plants in China, resulting in, lar in a large carbon footprint. At the time of writing, the market remains unaffected by China's latest anti-crypto sentiments, according to CoinMarketCap. It is trading at $17,100, which is up 28% from January 1st. Hmm. Yeah, that's changed since then. The, I think the price is actually down since then. But uh, yeah, so I don't know how much credence to give this. Um, but we do have a Bloomberg article, and this one is not much longer, so, hmm. So, let's see, they do kind of expand on things just a teeny tiny, so we may review this one. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really see that we're going to be seeing this, this shit affecting Bitcoin much. I think that in the 
in the near term, we're just going to see a, a migration of mining out of China. I mean, pff, you snooze, you lose. You know, and, and the, the mining community just cannot, cannot exist as, as it does with, with that kind of liquid firmament to build itself on, you know? Where it was better when the, the PBOC just fucking ignored, ignored it. Didn't even worry about it. Now I think that one of the problems is that we've we've seen where these the miners have been out there for a few years, right? Well, rather than going back and forth in town, they marry. They have kids. Rather than coming, you know, to and from town, they have a house built out near the the mining facility. And so now there's an additional demand on the electricity that goes to the mining and the town downstream. And this happens for like everybody that's in this this mining collective where they they get a house not not so far away. Well, again, this tax up the power demand of actual people as opposed to just mining. Puts an additional premium on that previously cheap or virtually free electricity that the miners were getting before. And so the, this is kind of a predictable outcome. <clears throat> and, and I guess we're, we're seeing another another thing that I think only Peter Schiff really predicted this one, that um, there's been an increasing size in their middle class there in China. And I mean, this is just, you, you can't work as hard as they have for as long as they have to get as far as they have in electronics and in, in the dominance of manufacture of it w without earning a little bit of cred, you know, get, getting above a base wage, you know, getting a little bit of uh, managerial latitude. You know, these things happen over time. And so, of course, you go from being the lowly MT to, you know, a shift lead or something like that. And that comes with pay raises. Which, of course, in turn, expands and enhances your lifestyle. And next thing you know, you're investing in mining. Anyway, let's digest this uh, Bloomberg article because I think it's probably going to tell us a little bit more than the previous one, but it's pretty much going to be the same sentiment I think continuing on Bitcoin, uh, this is off of uh, Bloomberg technology Bitcoin miners are shifting outside of China amid state clampdown now see that that's enunciated a little better and uh, this was originally authored on January 4th of 2018 at 10.59pm uh, two, uh, PST and it was Updated on January 5th, 2018, 3.04 a.m. PST. So clearly the same author who shall go on nameless. As China's crackdown on cryptocurrency broadens to Bitcoin miners, some of the industry's biggest players are shifting operations overseas. Bitmain, which runs China's two largest Bitcoin mining collectives, is setting up regional headquarters in Singapore and now has mining operations in the U.S. and Canada. Jihan Wu, the company's founder, said in an interview, BTC Top, the third largest mining pool, is opening a facility in Canada and via BTC, ranked number four, has operations in Iceland and America, their founder said. The moves underscore how China's once dominant role in the world of cryptocurrencies is shrinking as policy ma makers clamp down. After banning initial coin offerings and calling on local exchanges to halt virtual currency trading last year, Chinese authorities outlined proposals this week to discourage Bitcoin mining. The computing process that makes transactions with the cryptocurrency possible. Officials plan to limit the industry's power use 
and have asked local gov- local governments to guide miners toward an orderly exit from the business, people familiar with the matter said. Read more. Quick ticker explains pl- Bitcoin on blockchain. No, I don't think so. While the moves are unlikely to have a noticeable effect on Bitcoin transaction speeds, they could reshape the cryptocurrency mining industry. Miners have until recently flocked to China because of the country's inexpensive electricity, local chip-making factories, and cheap labor. They now have little choice but to look elsewhere. We chose Canada because of their relatively cheap cost and the stability of the country and policies, Zhang Zauer, founder of BTC Top, said in an interview. He also considered locations in Iran and Russia. And, you know, we covered this last year, but, um, or, yeah, last year, 2017. Uh, Russia, they are actually evaluating their various states to try and find which one would be the best as far as, you know, which would be the cheapest for mining setups to operate. And I think that's a, that's one of those contradictory flags because we keep hearing things like, you know, oh, Russia's going to clamp down, Russia's going to do this. No, 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 no. I, I think that if anything, Russia takes a look at what's going on in cryptocurrencies and says, man, we got to get in on this shit. We got to get in on it, and we got to get on it like yesterday. And I mean, they, they've made noises about having a crypto ruble, but I don't know. If you've listened to this show enough, you know that I don't really believe that a crypto fiat currency could be all that successful. I mean, especially if it's being traded publicly. You know, unless it's being mined publicly too, then okay. Now, now you're talking. You know, because then you're you're adding all of the advantages of cryptocurrencies back in by having voluntary members of your mining pools. Oh, hold, hold on one moment. I gotta rehydrate. All right. So yeah, Chinese government, um, again, trying to trip over their own feet and uh, hobbling their people in the process. I, uh, I hopefully it's just like all the other bullshit that we've we've heard out of China over the years. And, and again, this is not the first time that we've heard some earth-shattering for minor information. Um, or, or not miners, but, you know, Bitcoin users. Um, it's not the first time we've seen stuff like this. And so, you know, how it's actually going to bear out, I don't know. But my, my guess is that the limitations that they're going to put on electricity are actually in excess, slightly, of what, what their power consumption was last year that they're going to actually allow for expansion in mining. And while they may on the face be saying that they're going to be doing something about it, and they might actually make things a little teeny tiny tougher for you to do in China, I I think behind the scenes though, they're going to be having friends and, you know, people that they owe favors to and pulling them aside and saying, hey, get hard into this thing we'll we'll support you or I'll support you but you know just don't tell anybody else this will be between us and you know we'll we'll roll it that way see I I think that in the grander scheme right now what's going on is people are are and I say people because cryptocurrencies and mining and all that stuff it's the great leveler okay Donald Trump is a Bitcoin user, whether or not he's actually using Bitcoin. His choice not to use Bitcoin, that's a communication of his confidence in it. But it is a reflection of his participation in it, too. 
you know, because to not participate is is participating. It's a vote of confidence kind of thing. But he's just as likely as you are to get wrecked trading if he ever did engage in doing such a thing. And th- and that's where <clears throat> that's where cryptocurrencies ha- have become the big leveler because I don't care who you are. You could be the queen of England. You can still get wrecked. You could be, you know, a first semester freshman in in college. You know, this is the first semester you've been away from home or at least, you know, longer, farther than 500 miles from home and you get into this thing, you're you're just as likely to get wrecked, wrecked as... You know, Jim Rogers or Paul Krugman or Peter Schiff or Max Kaiser or any of these guys that have been in legacy markets for the last, you know, 20 to 40 years, maybe longer with regard to Jim Rogers. Um, I sometimes wonder about Paul, the Krug as I call him. I, I often wonder what his actual experience is because the guy is wrong so often. I think he's like, he's like a kind of like a circus clown or not not a circus clown one of those guys that uh during bullfighting the the bullfighting clowns i think he's like one of those kind of guys where he's just like there to divert the attention you know while while something really exciting is going on over your shoulder (laughs) (laughs) or over his (laughs) but you know I, i i can't imagine that somebody can be that wrong well i don't know maybe maybe Bernanke or Alan Greenspan you know maybe maybe one of these guys could be as wrong but I don't know it seems like Paul he like put some effort to it or something anyway I've stated it again and again and again and again all of this stuff works because of you and I think that we're going to see a lot more of you in it in 2018. I mean, you, you can't look at those spikes on the chart and not say, you know what, if I was involved in that, I would have been getting a piece of that too. You just can't do it. So, anyway, I wanted to touch on this, this article because it's actually Verge specific. And I was going to take a music break, but it's, it's just been too short between. So, I'm going to go for this thing. And uh, this one is... Um, oh, let's see. Who is the author of this bad boy? Or does it tell us? I don't know, but it was written on January 3rd, 2018. This is on... Uh, I think it's on Medium, actually. But it says uh, Crypto Ace with a 4 for the A... Dot com, And, uh, yeah, so here it is. The Verge XVG Currency Controversy. This is authored again on January 3rd, 2018 by Crypto Ace. I'm going to depart from the generic discussion on cryptocurrencies and focus on the very recent controversy that caught my attention regarding a particular altcoin. The sheer trade volume and over 100% price spikes in the past in the last several days brought the attention of the world to an inexpensive cryptocurrency that promises to be the next bitcoin. The Verge currency or XVG has overtaken bitcoin as the Twitter trending hashtag for over a week now. But it is not the trading nor the trending that is interesting to me at this point, but rather a controversy that is developing around this promising digital currency. I have done my due diligence and got educated about the technical aspects of XVG and what I saw was good. It worked as software development uh, development security engineer and have... I'm sorry, I worked as software development security engineer and have extensive experience and knowledge required to understand things that ordinary investors do not. And I realized that XVG is actually a very, very good coin. 
It justified high expectations of the seemingly devout Verge fam, or Verge family, but after a number of days with huge spikes, something strange started happening. A campaign of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, started to emerge before my eyes. It may have started earlier, but I first saw it when, after a huge spike in price, a stark warning started running circles on the internet. The rumor was that the main developer for Verge did not communicate with the rest of the team for over a month, and that the marketing team walked away. The quote, well-intended whistleblower warned people to dump the coin and within hours, if not minutes, others started sharing the ominous warning. The rumor picked up steam when Marquis Trill twitted that the rumor as I'm sorry, twitted the rumor as a proven fact over four, to over four million of his followers. Immediately after that, a whole bunch of essentially anonymous people started propagating the unsubstantiated and later proven false claim on all social medias like Twitter, Telegram, Facebook, as on the queue. The price took a hit immediately, but Marquis later deleted his tweet and claimed that he was hacked. If it all ended there, the story would be over, right? XVG recovered, but as soon as it did, another person aimed his guns at it. John McAfee, famous security expert who just weeks ago was praising privacy coins and who explicitly mentioned XVG in his tweets as well as in interviews on YouTube, suddenly changed his tune. In one of his earlier tweets, in an answer to a question by an investor on the possibility of XVG going higher within the next six months, he replied that it could possibly go up to $15. Now that he had changed his heart, he claims that that was not his official tweet and that the, snap, the screenshot of the tweet was fake, and yet many people have tweet, tweeted back and the screenshots they took themselves claiming that it was indeed on his official Twitter handle. As fate would have it, within a day of denying that he had ever said that Verge could go, over, go to $15 relatively quickly and then denying it, his official account started spewing weird and incoherent messages recommending certain coins and then withdrawing it and changing the recommendation to another coin, then talking about the third coin, then talking about being high on something and about owning souls or something, and finally claiming that his Twitter account was hacked, but like Marquis, just like Marquis Trill. Is that all? No, not at all. There is much more to this dark, intriguing saga. The Verge has been blasted in the past two days by everyone and anyone, or at least someone wants you to think so. A well-known cryptocurrency website started a series of articles that allege that the XVG privacy is not as strong as claimed, and it relayed the warning from their, co from their colleagues at another well at a well another I'm sorry at another well known website not to trust Verge with your life. It also referred to internet allegations that XVG Wraith Protocol, the part responsible for anonymity, is actually leaking IP addresses. Hmm. Now here's the problem with uh, that I have with these articles denigrating XVG. Number one, all, all, all articles are written in a manner that allow later repudiation of the sort of, quote, they said it, not us. Number two, no actual verifiable proof was given either by those websites nor by the source of the claims. Number three, they all seem to be published after several succeeding days of 100% price spikes 
within the last four or five days and, to me at least, they seem to be carefully timed and coordinated. 4. The claims of Wraith Protocol leaking information seem to have been made even before the protocol was actually released and activated on the network. As of this writing, the protocol has not been completely released and active. That amounts to claiming that iPhone 5, the iPhone 5S, the first model to introduce the feature fingerprint scanning feature, was not working by allegedly testing it on the iPhone 4. There seems to indeed exist a well-coordinated and funded, I might say as well, campaign to destroy Verge before it becomes too dangerous to someone, or perhaps it already has. Actually, to be fair, one of the websites released a retraction. Hmm. And apparently this was on uh, Crypto Crimson, uh, their, their update. Verge XVG is not leaking IP addresses of users. Oh, wow, that takes a lot of... It does take a lot of balls to, uh, to post a retraction, I gotta say. It's very good. Thank you. Interestingly enough, certain big XVG wallets are steadily increasing in size, seemingly unfazed by the onslaught of allegedly bad news about the coin. Now think about it. People who have much more money, clout, and experience in this game than you or I can ever dream of are hoarding XVG like there is no tomorrow. That should tell you something unless you have been living under a rock with regards to the worlds of the powers that be. Finally, it seems that many innocent but confused investors are unwittingly contributing to this FUD campaign. campaign. That's part of the process. The Verge team made certain delivery promises that were not kept, which contributed to the panic. Actually, the... Uh, the marketing team made promises that were not necessarily kept. Delivery promises, which have recently been taken care of. They also failed to take control of the situation once it developed like they could. It's called social media for a reason. I can understand their thinking, although cannot justify it. As a software developer myself, I understand full well that hardcore, co hardcore coders are usually focused on the end product, not on the customers, or in this case investors, and they seem to follow the maxim, if you build it, they will come. Ordinary cryptocurrency investors do not necessarily understand the development process and are trying to interpret the telltale signs the best they can. And often, they misinterpret them. For example, I have noticed that many people tweet and retweet the status of the latest Travis build of the Verge code as the sign of success or failure of the development effort. They tend to panic when they see that the latest build failed on three platforms, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and think that the developers have hit a roadblock and they breathe a sigh of relief if they see a green light confirming a successful build. The red or green color of the Travis build is completely unreliable to estimate anything. Travis is an online platform for running automated builds based on the latest updates from GitHub, an online repository of source code, source code. While it may be very useful, the Travis build environment has to be carefully configured in order to succeed. The developers might have configured it for the previous version, but when the new version was developed, the configuration was the configuration most likely needs to be updated to include new libraries, dependency, dependencies, compiler directives. The Verge team obviously did not do that, and while they were consistently having successful builds on their own development machines, the Travis build was inconsistently spewing red and green color depending on what code was updated and compiled. The development team, who has been under hu a huge amount of stress, I can't imagine, probably hoped that investors would rather see the end product polished 
tested, and released as soon as possible than for them to waste precious time on reconfiguring Travis, the Travis environment. Probably a wrong decision. I don't think so. They could have and should have handled it better and, pro and obviously they are under attack and all the misinformation could have been very effectively repudiated, which I did a lot. It is not as if they did nothing. They did try to communicate to the investors, but in a disorganized and highly scattered way. I had to sift through many different social media platforms like Discord, Reddit, Telegram, Twitter, and even GitHub to get the real picture and collect the information from legitimate members of the team among literally thousands of misinformed and misleading tweets and retweets. Dude, welcome to crypto. So here we are. Hopefully, I managed to clear up a little bit of the fog, eh, kinda. The main point is, if you are going to invest in cryptocurrency, you need to get educated and do not follow the herd. Lots of money can be made in cryptocurrency, but lots can be lost too. The money, however, will not disappear in, the, in thin air. It will end up in somebody else's wallet. Somebody who knows how to read through the FUD. As for, Ver for the Verge, it is a case of David fighting back against Goliath. I can see that the developers are wholeheartedly in this, working day and night to deliver. Even people attracted by the noise are pitching, to, and pitching in to help, as Eric Kriske, for example. With a, with a little luck, they will prevail, and Verge could be the next back, the, I'm sorry, could just be the next Bitcoin, making many faithful followers happy and rich, too. Yeah. You know, I don't worry about the rich part too much. I worry about the spending my Verge as money part. I imagine that that is in the future. Hmm. Maybe not as close as I would like, but all good things take time. And you know, I'm I'm not in a, a major rush to be spending my verge, so yeah, that's that's that. <clears throat> but it is with that I want to start wrapping up this episode because we have been running at a solid damn near three hours, and we are coming up to the tail end of it. Um, on Wednesday, I will be back again, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on RadioCrypto.com. Um, I am doing my best to uh, to get my stuff updated on the uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, although I did have a minor mishap on the last episode, in my attempts to cut down my lead time on the uh, on when I start recording. I neglected to hit record, and unfortunately, last Friday's episode was only for those of you who were actually listening, because I did not record it. But, we are recording this one, and so, yes, it will eventually make it up onto my YouTube channel. Um, and please, like and subscribe, and, and you know, check back in some of those other episodes. I, I bet you find some treasures, and... You know that I, I've made little predictions here and there that have played out as as things have gone on. Just uh, give you an idea of the veracity of my claims. Let me see if I do have anything else here for us, because I think I might actually have enough time for one teeny tiny teeny tiny smidgen article. And, yeah, I think this will do it. Hmm. Anyway, um, you'll be able to find me on Facebook, also on Twitter, and uh, in the IRC chat room for Verge. Also in Telegram, I may start going into Discord. I, I've, I've heard that it is quite discordant in there. Although, I don't know, Telegram is pretty discordant too. It seems like a, a lot of guys have fun in there. Anyway, let's get get into this last article, and this is kind of like along with our theme earlier with regard to video cards. 
and this is for you guys that are investing in in uh, regular conventional markets. You definitely want to pay attention to this. Uh, this one's on uh, CNBC.com. Goldman says Nvidia, the best chip stock last year, is headed for another big year. Yeah, I think they might get a kick in the dick. Nvidia's gaming business will drive further gains for the company's shares this year, according to a top Wall Street firm. Miss call. Goldman Sachs reiterated its buy rating for Nvidia shares, predicting the chip maker will report earnings ahead of expectations. <laughs> Quote, Nvidia is one of the few stocks in our coverage universe exposed to multiple secular growth markets with the emergence of esports and potential proliferation of VR slash AR, we view gaming as a meaningful and sustainable growth driver for the overall company. Analyst Toshi, Toshi uh, Hari, I think, we, did we already read this one? We may have. No, actually, I think we, we read one that was close to this, but... Sorry, I'm not going to reread the whole thing, but the the point being that they bumped six bucks a share for, um, or they're expecting forecast for 2019 for six dollars a share. Hmm. Um, yeah, like I said, I think if they um, if they get on the ball with this headless mining, you know, where they're they're making cards that are specifically designed for mining as opposed to being able to service both markets, I think that they will see that mining actually constitutes a, a far bigger segment of their profit, profits than they estimate. And uh, I, I think that's something that they don't really want to admit, but it's true. You know, like I said, they seem to be downplaying that, you know, in, you know, downplaying the fact that people mine with their cards. And, and I, I don't really understand it. I think maybe that they they thought that there would be a migration away from from uh, public mining. I, I don't I don't see that being being the case. Either that or again they're trying to confuse the market with sig certain signals and whatnot while they're telling their friends, hey, you might want to double down on your on your Nvidia position this next quarter. <laughs> But, uh, you know, like I said, I, I haven't been watching them closely enough to be able to determine their, their tenor as far as, you know, what their, their public messages are versus what their, their actual performance is, you know, quarter to quarter. And, um, like I said, I, I, I don't understand their downplaying of the, uh, of the video, uh, sorry, the, uh, the mining component of their their consumption or their demand rather but uh they do and uh i don't know i don't understand it i i would want everybody to know that you know people prefer my cards for mining because they're they're more profitable you know i would want people to know that you know why would you downplay it i don't know but I think that in their laxness to to you know be upfront and and honest about what their their actual yield is for the you know for miners as opposed to video game players, I think that could only help their prices on their on their or in their earnings, rather. But again, I I think that the the manufacturers, or, or at least the one we were talking about earlier, Gigabyte. Um, they're they're trying to go with the uh, the headless miner thing. I, I think that's actually going to bear out better over the uh, over this next year, and it's going to show that that's the that's the way to go. You know that uh, you've got to you've got to separate the con separate out the constituencies, and when you do, you are going to find out that a greater percentage of your demand is actually just miners. <laughs> It's not, it's not gamers, it's miners. Anyway, we want to wrap this one up. And I haven't played any body count today. So we're definitely going to close it out with body count. But we will be getting, we will be back again on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard 
time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe, do your homework, and watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. And so to exemplify my perspective on all this, because you got to be attending to your own interests throughout all of this stuff in order for it to work exactly as it's supposed to, here it is, Ski Mask Way, Last Dance, here on Coin Metal. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly appreciate the support. Like and subscribe on YouTube. I will be back again on Mon- Mon- oh, sorry, Wednesday, and I'll see you then. Y'all have an excellent evening. <laughs>